Hello. Uh, we're starting the second to the last chapter on General Path. I guess that's what they call the penultimate uh, chapter, and I feel, e feel really good about this. Uh, I've had a little bit of a lag in making these movies because I, I don't know, I guess I'm getting like writer's cramp or doctor's cramp, or I don't know what they call it, but I've been getting so many letters and comments and emails that are so overwhelmingly positive, I don't feel anymore like I'm just uh, speaking to a bunch of friends. I feel like I have a, a world duty, and it scares the hell out of me. So, I don't know, I guess I just got a little bit spooked about the whole thing. Anyway, we'll, uh, we'll start this chapter today, Environmental and Nutritional Pathology, one of the most well-organized chapters in the book. And, uh, you know, th the field of environmental and nutritional pathology is actually sort of new. It was not in the old uh, Stone Age editions of Robbins, which I read uh, many years ago. It's something that has resulted because of political correctness and the fact that a lot of things like toxicology or toxic pathology just didn't quite seem to fit anywhere and had to be thrown in here or there. So this is a great place for it. We'll be talking about... Uh, environment, toxins, uh, nutrition uh, in this uh, particular uh, uh, chapter. So uh, we'll be talking about how substances in the environment uh, interacting with our cells, our bodies, uh, cause diseases. Uh, if you want to call that exposures, you can. They can be environmental or they can be occupational, which is a type of environmental in which certain people are exposed more than others by virtue of what they do. We're also going to get a little bit into nutrition and uh, in particular uh, deficiencies or, or lack of uh, proper nutrition causing uh, disease states. Uh, and speaking of occupational diseases, I think you should keep in mind that there are a lot of ways you could classify it. And I think it's important how you classify it because it means a lot of money that governments, uh, our government, has to spend out every year. But uh, keep the focus on the fact that the vast majority of uh, occupational diseases are uh, repeated trauma. And even though you can classify things into skin diseases, lung diseases, poisonings, dust, and all this other stuff, in terms of payout, in terms of importance, uh, the really the most important thing, two-thirds of all the reported occupational diseases are due to uh, repeated trauma. Uh, and when you talk about exposures or of uh, toxic substances in the environment to enter our body, we have to go into several basic concepts before we mention a few. The first of all, we'll be saying a little bit about the threshold effect, and then we'll talk about the ways which the uh, toxins enter the body. And when you think about it, there's really only three ways they can. If you remember your anatomy and histology, I really can't think of uh, anything entering the body if it's not ingested, inhaled, or comes into skin contact. We'll talk about distribution uh, of toxic substances in the body, their metabolism, uh, their excretion, and some of their effects as well. Uh, did you ever wonder, no, let's talk about xenobiotics, which is the same thing we just mentioned. Xenobiotics are substances which enter our body. They're foreign, and that's why they get the name xeno, like a xenograft. And there are different ways our bodies handle these. Now, if you remember, in order for something to enter a cell, it has to become polar or relatively, n I'm sorry, it has to become relatively nonpolar because the, um, the membrane uh, of the cell is a lipid membrane, so uh, it doesn't allow things that are directly polar. It has to be relatively nonpolar. Our body reacts to making substances less nonpolar or less lipophilic or more polar by doing uh, basically two things. One is to modify the molecule, phase one, by adding a direct polar group onto the molecule. And the other is to conjugate it, which is called a phase two reaction by virtue of uh, combining it with another polar substance. There's a little bit of a difference here. In one case, you're adding something on. In one case, you're combining something. 
So the uh, systems of enzymes in the body, which are result in phase one uh, uh, reactions or modification, are the cytochrome-dependent monooxygenases, the flavin-containing monooxygenase system, and the peroxidase uh, cooxidation systems. These are all systems in which substances are uh, uh, given a polar group to make them more polar or less nonpolar and therefore less likely to enter the cell. Uh, in conjugation, you add a completely new molecule onto the substance, also making it less lipophilic. And of course, uh, the most common uh, situation uh, that, as an example of that, would be glucuronidation, but then biomethylation and glutathione conjugation are also methods by which toxins are uh, combining with other substance to make them uh, more polar. And this is pretty much a nice little diagram of what we have just uh, mentioned. Uh, you have an exposure of, a, so of a, a compound. It is absorbed at the three different portals of the body, the oral cavity, the lungs, the skin, and is distributed within the body. Now, it could be metabolized to become more toxic, or it could be metabolized to become less toxic. And it could uh, become less toxic through these phase one or phase two reactions. And of course, phase two is conjugation. If it's less toxic, it could very easily be excreted. In fact, one of the purposes of combining and conjugating compounds is to make them more likely to be excreted. On the other hand, these conjugated compounds are still technically within that component or compartment of the body of distribution as well. If the compound is toxic, it is further distributed into areas. Uh, it can interact with the various uh, molecules in the cell and organelles, the proteins, DNA, RNA, and so forth. It, this is where it does its damage. It could be the genetic damage, a carcinogenic damage, reproductive ge damage. In every case, we're talking about direct damage to uh, DNA, RNA, and uh, proteins and receptors. Uh, there can be a turnover and repair of the uh, cells, and the substances can be ultimately excreted. So this is basically how you should look at the distribution of toxic uh, substances which we are in our body from the environment. And speaking of environment, if you've ever wondered what was a toxic waste dumps, I mean, we all hear the term toxic waste, but if you actually had a list of the common things that are stored in the hundreds of toxic waste dumps in our country, we basically have everything from A to Z, acetone to zinc. Some of these uh, compounds you may recognize uh, pretty quickly, uh, aldrin, arsenic, barium, benzene, butanone, cadmium, a lot of heavy metals, carbon tetrachloride, things used uh, industrially uh, chiefly which are not easily uh, de biodegraded, chlordane, chloroform, chromium, cyanides, uh, pesticides, DDT, dichloroethanes, lead mercury, methylene chloride, nickel, pentachlorophenol, polychlorinated biphenols, tri- and tetrachloroethylene, toluene, vinyl chloride, zinc all compounds. What they all share in common is the fact that they're not easily converted or biodegradable into uh, non-toxic compounds, so they have to be stored, and that's why we have toxic uh, waste dumps. When you look at the uh, effect that toxic substances have on our body, basically if you take the concentration of the dose versus the cumulative response and maybe a clinical response a lab response these are compound this these are the curves that are used in toxicology studies technically if you have a dosage of a substance that produces no observable clinical effect that is a sub threshold dose at some point in varying the dose you have a response and that's called the threshold effect and then basically the more of a dose the more of a response Ultimately, until it, uh, whether you give, uh, it doesn't really have a uh, additive effect uh, until you get, no matter how much more substance you add. I know I completely screwed up that concept, so let's try it again. 
there's a point at which additional uh, concentrations of the toxic compound produces no further increase in toxic effects, and that's called the ceiling effect. But the one thing that is extremely important is the so-called uh, threshold uh, level. There is a threshold level for every uh, compound, every toxic compound uh, known to man. Thank you very much.